Welcome to our discussion on Three Mile Island. We have a panel discussion organized by Idaho National Laboratory. So thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Joel Hiller. I'm a communications specialist for the Nuclear Science and Technology Directorate. I'll be moderating the discussion tonight. So as a little bit of background, if you may recall, uh, three years ago, back, it probably felt like 10 years ago to everyone, uh, HBO released a miniseries on the Chernobyl accident. And at that time, we had a, a similar discussion. And there was a lot of interest in the community. And we had intended to follow that up with a lot more of those. And then a little thing called COVID kind of prevented us from having any, any follow-ups up to this point. So we're hoping this will be the first of many discussions with our community. But, so thank you all for coming. So, um, and then actually after everyone's done, we want you to pick up one of these little survey cards if you haven't already. And uh, there's a question on there so you can give us some ideas of additional topics you'd like us to talk about in the future. So uh, on the screen here, you'll see some instructions because uh, this is an interactive panel and we want you to tell us a little bit about what questions you want us to answer. So if you'll use uh, your phones and go to the URL that's up on the top here, that pollev.com slash I-N-L-O-D, that will help, that gives you the opportunity to vote on which questions our panel's going to answer. So, all right, now I'm curious if any of you have actually seen the, three, the Meltdown Three Mile Island series on Netflix. Okay, so definitely got a few. Um, yeah, it was, it, was, it was certainly interesting, it was very dramatic, it was focused on a lot of you know, speculation and a lot of personal storylines as opposed to you know, the, the actual details of the accident and what happened. So uh, we're looking forward to providing a little bit of additional information. Um, but it, you know, the Three Mile Island was a really important point, a turning point for the nuclear industry in that it helped spur a lot of additional innovations and changes moving forward. So, uh, and not only do we have a lot of INL experts who were involved, uh, in the removal of that damaged core, but our researchers have been studying the accident for decades since then and are helping to make continual improvements to make nuclear reactors even safer. And they'll be talking a little bit about that tonight. So uh, to start things off, we are going to have our first question using that poll EV tool for any of you guys who have that up on your phones. And we just kind of want to know what word you think about when you think about Three Mile Island. So you can take a couple of minutes uh, to give us your thoughts there. And while you're doing that, uh, we'll have our panelists uh, introduce themselves. So why don't we start off with John? Great. Thanks, Joe. Um, <clears throat> and thanks to the other panel members. Members, this is great. I recognize a lot of uh, faces in the audience, and um, it's great to have so many people familiar with Through Mile Island in the audience. So just a little bit about myself. I am currently um, a senior assistant secretary for nuclear energy in DOE. So most of the time I sit in DC um, working on um, current events in nuclear energy. Uh, but my, most of my career has been spent here at INL in nuclear fuel uh, fabrication, performance, behavior, including that in severe accidents. Um, I'm old enough to be familiar with most of the work that, was, that took place after the accident at Three Mile Island, um, but I'm young enough to actually, um, well, still be working. <laughs> Unlike Doug, <laughs> who was here when I started, and we worked together on the project that I first started and when I first came to the laboratory. Um, Doug did a lot of the work here at the laboratory on Three Mile Island material that was brought here. So there's a lot of people I uh, recognize in the audience who have touched and have been touched by Three Mile Island over the years. So my perspective of Three Mile Island is that uh, we learned a lot from Three Mile Island. Um, I, I attribute most of what happened at Three Mile Island to give us what we know today in the nuclear industry in the United States in terms of being able to operate plants better than 90% of the time. We have very few times in the nation that uh, probably 90% of our plants aren't up and operational at 100%. And I attribute that to the lessons learned that were really sort of taken out of the Three Mile Island event. Um, many of the things that we do in research for nuclear energy today come because of the reasons, things we learned in Three Mile Island. Um, I had the privilege of running uh, for DOE for about 10 years, the advanced fuel program that develops new and alternative fuels for, any, for nuclear reactors, including light water reactors. 
Um, and in 2012, just after Fukushima, we started a program called the Accident Tolerant Fuel Program, which was based on how to, could we build new fuel or alternative fuel that would perform better and not melt in overpower accidents in, in, in nuclear reactor systems. And that program is still operational today, working on advanced fuels for that purpose. Um, in uh, about 2013, 2014, I was involved in getting um, a lot of information transfer from the lessons learned and the information that we developed here in Idaho um, on Three Mile Island debris and how to handle severely damaged fuel, how to process it and how to store it safely for many years. And we transferred that directly to the people in Japan who are responsible for Fukushima cleanup. Um, so I see it as, uh, you know, we've had a long history of lessons learned and good information that we have learned and been able to transfer to others who are in similar situations. Thank, thank you, John. Yeah, Mary Lou. Good evening, everyone. I'm Mary Lou Dunza Galger. I'm a professor of nuclear engineering at Idaho State University. Um, previously, I uh, worked at what is now the Materials and Fuels Complex of INL and did, did some research there. I also um, am, a, am a licensed operator for the little reactor we have at Idaho State University. And I wear uh, a number of different hats in that role, but I wanted to um, follow up briefly on John's comment about all the changes that were made because of TMI. One of the hats I wear is in a role with the Institute of Nuclear Power Operations which is an entity that was in, in the formation phase at the time of the TMI accident. And part of what they began doing as a result of the accident was accrediting the training programs, training for operators, training for technicians. And I sit on one of the boards that accredits those training programs. So I have learned a lot in that uh, role that I play. I also have a personal connection, outside my professional connection, to the TMI accident. I grew up in Millersburg, Pennsylvania, about 30 miles away from TMI. I was a freshman in high school at the time of the accident. And while some people ask me how and why I ever got into nuclear, I, I can't really answer, but it is definitely true that before the TMI accident, I don't know that the word nuclear was even in my vocabulary. And certainly got there as a result. Um, and I joked earlier with Joe there in the back that um, there had to be some effect of that accident on my future. I certainly went toward nuclear. Meanwhile, my mother went the other way. And we don't talk about my profession very much. <laughs> That's enough for now. Okay. Is that on? Sounds like it's great. Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Seth Cantor. I'm the radiological engineering manager uh, for the lab. And as John, one of the things he said was that TMI touched a lot of folks. And without a doubt, um, I was at uh, a US Navy nuclear program prototype the day of the event. And at that time, didn't think it would have much impact. And I can tell you, having participated in some of the accredited training from IMPO, it's had a, a huge impact on my entire career. So uh, after I um, spent eight years in the Navy, I did 30 years in commercial power, which I can tell you, um, Three Mile Island is an ever-present type of learning there uh, at those stations. And the changes I saw over the decades was pretty remarkable. Uh, since then, I retired. and. I had to do something, so I'm here at the lab promoting nuclear energy, which is definitely one of my passions. And um, while I was in commercial power, one of my primary functions was actually as a primary plant investigator to analyze you know, events, and obviously not at the magnitude of a Three Mile Island, but to take a look at that and how do we improve. That's something that nuclear energy does all the time, continuous improvement. So I have a lot of background about this. 
Uh, also coming from the Navy nuclear program, if you watch the series, you'll notice that the control room operators and even the whistleblower came out of the US Navy nuclear program. So I can speak pretty authoritatively to their training, their mindset. Uh, some of the actions they took were definitely in keeping with um, some of the actions that they did take in the early morning hours. And uh, as we go through this, if you have questions on the radiological conditions during the event in the plant, on site, off site, I can talk to that. And as a certified health physicist and a, a nuclear engineer, um, I've got a lot of background in that. So looking forward to the discussion. Really appreciate everyone being here tonight. Okay, I think we all get like the gold star for figuring out the microphone. So um, I'm Katia LeBlanc. I am a human factor scientist at Idaho National Lab. I've been at the lab for about 12 years and I have focused most of my career on how to design the systems that humans interact with so that they can be operated safely. Um, Three Mile Island is an event that is largely influenced by the operator actions and uh, it, they were inappropriate and I, I'm here to sort of give that perspective of why they were, why they did what they did, um, what, uh, how the organization, organization set them up to, to make the errors that they did, and also a lot of the um, really important lessons learned that came out of that. Um, human factors as a prominent discipline in the nuclear energy industry is because of Three Mile Island. And so there's a lot of um, processes, a lot of regulation, and a lot of lessons learned that we apply every day in how we operate the plants. Thank you. So as you can see, we have a wealth of experience here on the stage uh, who can help us examine the, the accident through a lot of different lenses. And what we want to do now is just start off with a brief overview of how a power plant works so, you, so we can all understand you know, what the normal conditions would be before we get into the accident. So uh, Mary Lou, if you'd give us a little bit of a, an overview. I'm a teacher. I have to point. Excuse me. Um, so just making sure we're all on the same page about what we're talking about. This is a very generic pressurized water reactor, which is the type of reactor that was at TMI. The basic function of a reactor is to make heat, right? We could, we could sort of replace everything inside that big containment dome with a coal boiler or, or a boiler of any kind that was fueled to make heat boil water. But in this case, we're doing a fission reaction, controlling a fission reaction, facilitating a fission reaction to create that heat. A key feature that plays into the accident that happened at TMI was that there's a primary loop of water that's outlined in green that's under pressure so that it's not allowed to boil. And that water goes to the purple loop of water and that purple loop is not pressurized, so it's allowed to boil. And what we're going to find is that there was a malfunction in the component that helps control the pressure in the primary loop that's shown up there as the pressure tank. Uh, that'll be discussed a little bit more by John. But part of the key to the accident was a malfunction associated with that pressure tank, and the whole purpose of that tank is to keep the pressure at the appropriate level so the water doesn't boil. And again, any power plant that burns something to make steam has a balance of plant, the stuff outside that dome that looks pretty similar. You use steam to turn the turbine, the turbine spins the generator, you make electricity, water is condensed, it goes back into the loop. Over to you, John. Oh, so now we're going to talk about what actually happened during the accident. Um. So let's go back to the first slide, the previous slide there, Joel. There we go. Okay. So just to try to keep it pretty simple, um, if you watch the Netflix series, I'll hold my microphone too because I stand up and point also. Um, <clears throat> Earlier, they, they did a pretty good. Um, description in the Netflix series of what actually instigated and progressed through the, the uh, accident at Three Mile Island. And they were able to do that because um, 
that's where it's very well documented in literature, um, as well as studies by the Nuclear Regulatory Committee Commission, um, Idaho National Laboratory, which at the time was INEEL, um, and EG&G was the contractor at the time. So you hear people talk about EG&G did this or INL did that. But it's pretty well documented what actually happened in, to instigate the, the accident. The operators had um, performed some testing, some maintenance and testing previously in the day, and they believe they dislodged some, some kind of material in the, in the primary reactor coolant system. <laughs> Problem. Oops. <laughs> Speaking of accidents. Um, so on top of the pressurizer on this tank, there's a pressure-operated relief valve. It's like the pressure-operated relief valve on your hot, on your heat, on your hot water heater in your house, is if it overpressurizes from too much heat, it'll open up and relieve some, relieve some of the pressure. And so that pressure-operated relief valve, when it was, the testing had happened earlier in the day, it had um, opened and expelled some steam. And the operators had, at some point, in, um, did not understand, did not know, did not sense that that pressure-operated relief valve had either material stuck in it um, that kept it from sealing back um, or was intermittently opening and closing because of a malfunction. Um, there is a way that they have a valve downstream of it that they can close and specifically stop that steam from going through the pressure-operated relief valve, but they didn't recognize that um, immediately. So they had indications in the plant that they were losing steam. Um, so they closed their valve with the block valve and turned off the reactor coolant pumps, which they never should have done. And they even state in the, in the Netflix series, they had the, the, the poor operators who were responsible that day testified in front of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission about specifically the decisions they had made and who was responsible for doing exactly what. And I, was, I almost cried watching those guys do that because you could see in their faces that they, they knew that they had made mistakes and it was killing them that they had made those mistakes. But it was a pretty simple failure that they failed to recognize and failed to sense on their instrumentation. And it caused them looking through their procedures to, close, to shut off their reactor coolant pumps, which we know you never shut off cooling to your core because you have to get the heat out. And so they had the pumps off for a f about an hour, uh, maybe to an hour and a half, before they recognized they needed to turn them back on. And by that time, they speculated and sensed that they had done some severe damage inside the core. But after that, they, no one really knew how much damage they had done until they actually were able to open the reactor and look inside. So let's look at the next slide there, Joel. So this is just so we know what it looks like inside the reactor. Um, this, is a mo this is a schematic of a nuclear fuel assembly. And each of these little pins, which is about the size of this pin in reality, it's about a half inch in diameter. And these ones are about, I believe, 10 feet, well, 13 feet long. Um, and um, they're usually, these ones are probably 17 by 17 in an array. So there's a number of these fuel pins bundled into assembly. And they're somewhere in the neighborhood of 100 to 100 and well, actually 150 to 160 fuel assemblies in a reactor arranged in a pattern that uh, makes up the core. Now, you may see different sizes and different um, arrangements from different types of reactors. Um, the Russians use a little bit different style of assembly than, than we do here in the West. Uh, some people use a little bit longer fuel assembly, some a little bit shorter. Some use five pin by five pin assemblies um, and so there are some slight design differences, but in, in general, these are the types of the fuel assemblies that were in Three Mile Island. And each fuel pin is made up of really two or three things. Um, I say three because there's a spring in the top of it, um, but these are individual pellets that are about the size of, it's about a half inch in diameter, and about a half inch long. So I, I use about the end of my pinky finger. So from your first knuckle of your pinky finger to the tip is about the size of one of these pellets. And they're made out of uranium oxide. So it's a very hard ceramic material that's very, really pretty rugged. And they melt at 2300 degrees Fahrenheit. So they melt, or that's in centigrade, so I can do 4000 Fahrenheit. So they have high melting points. 
very high melting points. They're encased in a, in a zirconium alloy metal tube, and it's just a simple tube. It looks a lot like a steel tube. Uh, so we load, a, you know, 10 feet of fuel pellets in a uh, zirconium pen, weld the ends closed, and seal them. They're filled with um, probably helium gas, just, for, just to give some pressure. And then a spring is in the top to hold the pellets in, in place. So they're pretty simple assemblies and, and pieces of equipment. Um, and the challenge comes is if you, they produce so much heat that if you don't continually cool them after they've been running, um, the pellets, the uranium oxide pellets, will physically melt through their zirconium cladding because their zirconium cladding melts at about half the temperature of the pellets. And so that's what causes, quote, meltdown. And you'll end up relocating hot pellets around the reactor, even with, um, um, without it, them pulling, you know, actually producing power, they still have residual heat in, their, in those ceramics, and so they tend to melt other structures as well. And so if you look at these models that we have sitting up, there's a half there, and where's my other half? Half in front. Those two models go together, and they were made in the late or the mid-1980s um, here at the laboratory as a model of what the core end state of Three Mile Island was after the event. And so there was a lot of speculation after the accident as to what had happened inside the reactor. Uh, some people thought maybe there was a little melting. Other people speculated there was no melting. Um, other people speculated that there was a lot of melting. And in fact, those people were right. There was a lot of melting that took place in the reactor. And almost everything melted in the core structures, including control rods, fuel element, fuel assemblies, structural materials, um, instrumentation. You know, so the instrumentation inside the reactor, totally different materials, may have rubber coatings on them. So there's all kinds of stuff that could melt and mix together in that core. And it melted and then formed what I can, and one of the reasons I love to watch lava in Hawaii is when you see it pour into the ocean, that's what I imagine is this looks like when you melt and start relocating molten material. It relocated to the bottom of the pressure vessel and re-solidified on the bottom. Um, if you watch Chernobyl, Chernobyl, they talk about the elephant's foot, which is a total mixture of a lot of different materials that have run together and formed a molten mixture that runs like lava throughout spaces, relocates, melts through things, and ends up in unexpected places. The interesting fact about Three Mile Island is that it, it didn't melt through the pressure vessel. So we talk about, and I think Seth may talk about, our three boundaries of safety, which is the, the, what we use to restrict and keep fission products from entering the environment. And the first boundary is the fuel itself, which retains much of the fission products and gases inside of its structure. The second boundary would be um, the fuel pan cladding, the zirconium. So as long as it's intact, it retains fission products and radioactive material inside of it. And then if it's not intact and it gets out into the reactor vessel itself, the vessel and the piping is the third boundary for restricting the release of radioactive material. So I think, let's go to the next slide. I think we covered this, we covered this pretty well. So in this, you can see the, the pressurizer again. There's a block valve in between it and the, pr the pr uh, pilot operated, I call it the pressure operated relief valve because it's sort of automatic. It's like a relief valve on your, on your hot water heater. But when you sense that relieving pressure, you can block it closed and the, re the reactor operators did that um, to try to stop their pressure, relief, their pressure drops. So let's go to the next slide. Let's see. So this is the event timeline. You can see, and Seth may talk more about this. Who's talking about this one, Joel? This me, still? This was you. It's still me. And you, you've you have to cover anything you've already covered, but this right. kind of gives people a good idea of the timeline. The only thing, what I'll, cover, what I'll talk about here is that if you notice what time it was starting to happen, and I think we'll maybe cover this in some of the questions, it's like human interactions with 
with machinery is um, it started at 4 a.m. Um, actually, my son is in the audience, Jack. Um, and Jack just uh, finished working for Idahoan uh, Potato Factory up north of here on the back shift. Your best decisions are not made at 4 a.m. in the morning. And I think Jack can attest to that. So um, this accident actually started to really come up on the um, behavior and instrumentation of the plant at 4 a.m. The operators are tired near the end of their shift, and we think that that probably did have um, consequences and impact on their actions and what they decided to do. Um, you know, not picking up immediately on what could be happening, what are the possibilities, and then what actions they decided to take at, the, at that time. So by 620, they closed the block valve to stop pressure relief, but super, super hinted steam was still in the system meaning really hot steam, and they need to restart the pumps. And so at 7.50, they restarted the pumps. So you can see that it's you know, multiple hours of not having um, coolant, going to active coolant fed to the core, and removing that heat that needs to be heat removed from the, from the reactor. I think I'm good on that. That's Great. A good question. Thank you. No, that, that was a really good job of covering the technical side of things. And that leads us to our next topic, which is kind of the communications. So this is all happening in the plant, but what, was, what did people know? When did they know it? How did they learn about it? So Mary Lou will walk us through that. Sure. Um, I was asked to uh, speak on this topic because I'm sort of a, a chronic communicator. Um, I was a, a high school teacher before I went to graduate school, and now I'm a professor, and I do public outreach. And so while I'm a nuclear professional, I'm also very passionate about communications. And there are a lot of interesting communication components of this accident that exacerbated the accident. And some of that communication was actually not public communication, but internal about things happening in the industry. There wasn't a very good way of sharing information um, from one utility to the next, those that operated power plants, there wasn't much communication um, between NRC and some of the operators. There just wasn't a, a system set up to allow that. And even that, even if the internal communication had been uh, better, um, we wouldn't even have had to worry about the external because the accident never would have happened. The reason I say that is because this exact scenario where that um, pilot-operated relief valve popped open happened twice before, one time in Switzerland and one time in the U.S. at other plants. And if that had been communicated more broadly um, around the industry, this would have been one of the things that the operators would have looked for right away. But because of the way they were trained and because of the nature of, of the, the interaction of the operators with the instrumentation, it wasn't obvious to them. John mentioned that the operators made some mistakes, and he's right. Um, in the days uh, when I was a high school science teacher, uh, I, I apparently had the nuclear um, bug even then because um, I participated in a summer workshop for high school teachers, and we went to TMI and one of the operators who was on duty at that time talked to him. And, and I had the same impression that John had. This guy, he was sad. <laughs> I mean, he was practically in tears. He understood the significance of what he did, but he also was wanting to talk about it and, and um, help everybody learn from it. Um, one of the things that the operators were worried about was the level of water in that pressurizer. So they had a water level indication for the pressurizer, but they didn't have a water level indication for the vessel itself. And they assumed because the, the, pressure, the water level in the pressurizer was really high, that it was also really high in the vessel, but it wasn't. And so, they were watching this water level in the pressurizer thinking, we can't, we can't let it go solid. They called it solid if it was all water and no vapor. They needed to have a mixture of water and vapor so that they could increase vapor to push down or decrease vapor to let the water level go up and decrease pressure. Okay, so they were trained never let the pressurizer go solid. 
And so they made the logical choice. They stopped the pumps because they couldn't let it go solid. So they just had um, training and, and procedures and a, a perfect storm of training, procedures, and, um, and interface with, with, the, um, with the instruments that led them to make that choice. And, I, and you all can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it was very early in the accident that the, the uh, melting actually occurred. I, by the time they turned the pumps back on, I think everybody agreed it was already probably melted by then. <coughs> Um, so that's sort of the internal communications aspect. Um, and part of what happened as a result was um, a change in emergency plans that would allow um, communications to be part of the plan and doing drills and practicing that and having coordination among um, the power plant, the NRC, the state and local governments, and all of that was incorporated going forward. But you have to remember the scenario, most of you would remember the scenario in 1979. I mean, we had landlines, you know. We had no, we had no internet, we had no cell phones. Um, and there wasn't a dedicated communications or external communications person on site. So reporters got wind of something, they're calling the plant, they patch them through to the, the control room, the operators pick up the phone and they said, I can't talk now, I'm busy, right? I mean, yeah, they, we didn't want them to be talking to the media, they were trying to, to uh, diagnose the problem. They were communicating with NRC, they were communicating with the utility at headquarters 40 miles away. When media people contacted the, um, PI person at headquarters, well, he was 40 miles away and he didn't really know what was happening real time either. So there were just, it, it really was a perfect storm in so many ways of miscommunications. Um, there also was not just a lack of technology, but a little bit of an environment um, in, in the general public at that time. If you think about the time, um, there was, you know, civil unrest. Um, there was protest against the Vietnam War in the 60s into the 70s. Uh, there was Watergate and uh, sort of a mistrust of government and communications. Um, and so there was just that environment of maybe not really trusting what, what was being um, provided by the official folks and more appreciation of the investigative reporters like the ones who uncovered Watergate. So I think everything really played a role um, in terms of what people were willing to believe and maybe skeptical. And I don't blame them because they, um, it was scary. It was scary not knowing. Um, my mother, back to my mother, um, uh, didn't know what to think. You know, she had two children in school and she didn't know what was happening because there were mixed reviews on the, on the radio, on television, where everybody got their news at the time. Um, and so people were confused and certainly concerned, rightly so, about the safety of their families. I will leave it at that, but there are so many other things we can talk about relative to the communications. But as John suggested, so many changes have occurred, and not just in nuclear, but in every industry about emergency preparedness, emergency communications, uh, coordinating among entities that just wasn't a thing before TMI. And so other industries learned as well from what happened. So um, Seth, in his uh, role as uh, the radiological expert, we'll talk about that aspect of the accident. Yep. That's a great segue. That's better than I could. And Mary Lou, if you want to come over here. Yeah, no, that's perfect. So yeah, Seth, that, that leads us into what were people thinking? They were worried about radiation. So exactly what was the situation? How dangerous was it? Um, okay, I'll, I'll talk to that. But there's a few things that I want to come back to on these last two topics. Because I think they really speak to what was going on in the control room, both from uh, that's really important on this event. But from a radiological standpoint, <clears throat> As John mentioned, we have different barriers for the fission products. 
And when everything's operating correctly, uh, we primarily retain those in the fuel rods. Uh, there are sequences or times or small amounts that normally get into your cooling system, but uh, that's part of the design. And in this particular case, uh, we, we, we lost those. Uh, fortunately, the reactor vessel itself contained the bulk of the equipment, but the very last part, what really separates our reactors from, say, Chernobyl, is the containment building it is, that it's in is a giant pressure vessel surrounded with high-density concrete that's full of uh, very large uh, cables that are strung tight, and it's designed basically to hold up to about 60 pounds of pressure <clears throat> in there. So if the entire system in there, all that water turned to steam, it would stay in there. That particular design feature worked as designed. So when this accident happens, uh, the pilot operated relief valve is stuck open. This is now venting into containment through a tank that's normally this designed to hold small amounts of this. And <clears throat> so the, the, you know, we have this air steam mixture in there. We've, we have the part of the uh, core uncovered and the heat there, as John was mentioning, the uranium starts melting the zirconium. It's exposed, they turn the pumps back on. And we now have this air, water, oxygen mixture that causes the zirconium to start breaking down. It's called zirc hydriding. Produces um, hydrogen. A lot was made in the uh, documentary that there was an explosion. There wasn't, there was a burn. And when they went into the containment years later, uh, you could see everything was charred from that. Depending on the concentration for hydrogen, it's more times than not flammable, not explosive. So that's what had happened. But they, when they realized the mistake and they start putting water back in, um, the containment is actually the bottom is a giant sump. And there's a system in the top called the containment spray system. It's like a sprinkler system. So once that, those sump levels get high enough, there's a pressure switch in there uh, that will go on and these spray pumps will activate. And that's what actually ignited the, the hydrogen. But that has a, that doesn't exceed the design pressure. At that time, nothing was uh, released. Everything was still in the containment building. And so they were starting to, you know, this is, once they had the pumps back on, the accidents mitigated, they're really in figuring out what's going on and cooling down the reactor as much as they can. That's how they're trained uh, to operate. But now you have a lot of water in there, you have a lot of uh, gas. There's some systems in there that go to ancillary buildings that support the reactor. And it was about two or three days later when they realized they needed to um, release some of the pressure in the containment. Now, during normal operations, that's also a normal thing that goes on. Uh, you have small primary and atmospheric leaks. You have valves that are actually op air operated. So every time an operator opens and closes one, it puts air into the containment. And over uh, time, about a month, it'll build up a few pounds and they actually can vent that air off. So they decided that between the pressure in the containment and they knew they had hydrogen and a lot of gas in there, they would vent it out. And it goes through a filtration system, uh, starts with charcoal, which removes your radio iodines, and then HEPA filters for the particulate. But the atmosphere in there isn't normal. It's very high humidity, so there's a little degradation to the charcoal. So small amounts of iodine were released. But noble gases, normally we have an ability to strip that out of solution during operations. We put them in tanks, we let them decay, and then we release it. We didn't have that opportunity in this situation. So 99% of the radioactivity that was released was in the form of noble gases. Um, obviously, when you're doing that on site, those are your highest concentrations. But we look at that in terms of by the time it leaves the plant, till it gets to the site boundary, till it gets to the general public, what's going on? And a lot of study has been done on this area. This is one of the fields of study I've worked in. Um, there was several million people around. A small part of those people might have received, and I'm saying might have, because it's all by calculation, about one to two millirem. 
That's a very, very small unit of measure. We have a chart in the back to kind of give you an idea of, you know, radiation is ubiquitous. It's around us all the time naturally. You go to the doctor, get an x-ray, you know, a chest x-ray, well, how much exposure am I getting? That's two to four millirem. So this is half of that amount. We have the chart here, Seth, if you want to refer to it. Oh, so you, sure. So if you look at the very top there, you'll look at the uh, normal doses that people would get from living around a nuclear power plant or getting medical things. And then you'll see it progressively goes down uh, to higher and higher doses of what the possible effects could be. Uh, as far as the general public, nobody received any uh, exposure of any significance. I know there's a lot of questions about cancer. Those will come up. We can talk about those kinds of things. Uh, in the documentary, uh, they tried to insinuate that because of these releases, that that might have had some causes. They showed one person who said they had rashes on their body. Um, I can tell you, to, to get to that type of, of outcome on your skin takes a very large amount of radiation dose. Uh, there was, there's no way that that would happen there. It could have been stress. It could have been an allergic reaction. Nobody really knows, but it certainly cannot be associated with the plant. But when you watch it, you get that, that insinuation. There was also some fish kills. Uh, in addition to normally releasing some uh, radioactive material to the atmosphere, these plants also sometimes discharge to the cooling waters around them. Very normal, it's a controlled process. And again, I think they tried to make it look like it was a direct cause. Uh, I can tell you it wasn't due to radiation or anything. I think the two best theories I've seen on that, one might, might have been an algae bloom. The other one is when these plants operate, the cooling water from, from condensing steam is, is warmer than the surrounding water. Fish like that. And so they're out there swimming around, they really enjoy that, and now all of a sudden that's gone. So it could have been a thermal shock, but it certainly, you know, had nothing to do with that. And they didn't present any evidence in either of those cases. I think they want the viewer to draw that conclusion. Um, I think there'll be some other stuff that comes up. There was a lot of, uh, well, going back to communications, um, you know, on the back shift, there's two people in the control room and a shift supervisor is in, off in a, an adjacent office. That staffing model doesn't exist anymore. So you have minimal staff, people are trying to go around, find things, people start showing up in the morning, asking questions. There's film that actually shows, you know, reporters putting a microphone in their face, what's going on? They're, they're just trying to get readings. So the information they're getting is, is very choppy, very confused, and um, those are actually some of the improvements that, that were really made for that. So there'll be more later, but that's a, a good synopsis of what was going on uh, in the plant and off, pl off the site. Katya? Okay, so um, from the operator's perspective, I think it's, uh, you know, obviously the operators take a lot of responsibility for what happened because they took inappropriate action. But if you look at the evidence, there's, it's easy to come to the conclusion that it's, you can't blame the operators. They acted in accordance with their training, with their experience. And if you look back at the, I believe it was Mary Lou who mentioned the davis Betsy Bessie incident where um, they had a very similar failure of their uh, pressure operated or pilot operated relief valve. And the operators took the exact same action because they were trained the exact same way they shut down the reactor coolant pumps. And the difference between that and a Three Mile Island is uh, the fact that they caught it sooner. They realized um, in 20 minutes rather than several hours that, uh, that, that the uh, leaf valve had been stuck open. That points to a sort of systemic issue with the way the operators are trained to respond to these sorts of events. Um, in addition, the uh, human factors the, the way that they're trained to look at their indications, to use their indications, to follow procedures, and also how they interact with other people in the control room and sort of come to a consensus about what's happening and uh, uh, during one of these events, um, and the fact that they 
didn't practice these kinds of events. They focused more on normal operations and made some assumptions that were incorrect. Uh, demonstrates that this is not this is not something that you can say the oper these are just bad operators who took inappropriate actions. Uh, you have to really look at the entire system, at the organization, and the, the failures of how that happened. And luckily, we've learned a lot from that, and we have a lot to uh, to point to to say that uh, this is this is how you operate things successfully and safely. Uh, thank you. That was uh, really great. In fact, that leads us to our, our first question. So as our panelists are discussing, you'll see some different questions pop up here. Free, feel free to start answering those as they're talking, and we'll be able to move on to the next topic. So staying with the, the topic of, of the reactor operators, you know, how is it that they could be so confused about what was happening? And, and several of the panelists touched on this a little bit, but, but maybe Kai you could give us a little bit more um, just about, you know, what was it that they were not seeing or understanding properly that led them to make those cascading decisions? That okay, I was going to step down and go to the... Yeah. Um, turn this off. Beth, I saw you move. Was there something you wanted, oh, yeah, wanted me to say or should I save it for you? No, no, you go. I might have some stuff I'd like to add to this. Okay, so actually Mary Lou answered a lot of this, so I'm just going to provide some additional, um, some additional context. Um, so something that I think, and I was going to see if, I was hoping Seth would mention this. I'm not sure I heard this. What, the initiating uh, failure was actually a loss of the main feed water pumps, um, and that's what feeds water to the steam generator. The steam generator takes heat from the reactor, um, and so that's ultimately what was the initiating failure. What's supposed to happen when you lose the main feed water pumps is you're supposed to have your ox feed water pumps uh, take, take effect, start up, and um, uh, start providing that water to that system. Uh, Seth can talk about why some maintenance issues as to why that didn't happen, but both of those systems failed. And so what we ultimately have, and I don't know if John went over this, I'm sorry if you did, I wasn't, I don't know if I did not uh, pay enough attention, but so then you ultimately have a loss of heat transfer. So you actually, or you have hot water and there's nowhere for it to go, that heat. So as Mary Lou mentioned, the, um, the purpose of the pressurizer is to keep the water liquid, not boiling. Um, and the pr purpose of this is when the pressure increases, this relief valve that we've been talking about that's stuck open is to open and relieve that pressure. Well, as we know, this is key to understanding what was happening. This pressure op or this pilot operated relief valve. I tend to say pressure operated <laughs> relief valve too. Um, and so when, without knowing the state of this, you don't understand what's happening. And that's really because when you have uh, complex, well not complex, when you have things changing phase, going from liquid to steam, it's hard to understand what's happening if you don't understand what the pressures are and whether, you know, what the temperatures are because the relationship, it, it, whether something's liquid or, or, or steam depends on the pressure and the temperature. And if you're not aware of what the pressure really is and where, where things are happening, you don't have sensors all across these uh, systems, you only have level indicators up here, you don't have them down here, and you might not have an awareness of all the different locations in the primary system. The operators didn't realize what was happening. They didn't understand that the water here was boiling, the level here was dropping, and as Mary Lou mentioned, they were, um, they were concerned about filling the pressurizer fully and having the system go solid, and they were trained to not ever let that happen. And so they had sort of competing objectives going on and didn't understand the situation. The last little thing is this pilot operator relief valve, the reason they didn't understand it was stuck was because the indications that it was closed. Um, and what, what, it, what the indication actually meant was that the signal had told it to close, but that the signal had been sent, but it didn't give you any indication of the actual state of the valve. So the operators had misleading indication. In the case of um, their training was actually trained them to use pressurizer level as their level of whether the core was covered um, because they made the assumption, which is absolutely true in normal operations, that um, if the pressurizer has appropriate level, that the primary system has enough liquid in it to cover the core. And so all of those combinations, uh, the fact that the, their indications, they, had, they didn't have indications in places, they had misleading indications in other places, and that they were trained to understand the situation very differently from what it was happening because their training didn't prepare them for uh, understanding these complex dynamics and also dealing with 
multiple failures. So you had two systems that are supposed to be operating fail, and then a, a relief valve, oops, a relief valve a fail with failed indication all at once. They, don't they didn't have experience responding to events like that. So that's why they were so confused. Thank you, Katya. Seth, did you want to add a little bit to that? Yeah, I think that when you're talking about this, you know, the operators initially you might think, well, they really made a lot of mistakes. The initiating event here um, it started on the secondary side. As John had told you uh, before, you have the primary side, the heat from the fissions removed, taken to the uh, steam generator, the water that comes in from the feed system, it turns into steam, goes to the turbine, where cooling waters, you see those giant cooling towers, if you ever wondered what those were, that cooling water goes through these, these condensers, condenses that steam back to water, goes back to the steam generator. That's basically how this works. During the day, they had actually um, worked on some of the components here, two very important ones. First one, the, this con condensate water has demineralizers that remove impurities. They got done with it, put it back in service, and left the vent valve open. The other thing that happened is, in addition to the feed pumps, they have steam-driven auxiliary feed pumps. If these feed pumps go offline, these steam-driven ones operate because there's a lot of heat in that reactor. The primary way that we take it out is through those steam generators. So this valve's open, they lose vacuum, it trips the feed pump. Okay, the auxiliary feed pump's supposed to take on. It was tagged out for maintenance during the day. The operators didn't know that. And in the control room, where those lights would show that, they had these really large tags covering it. The operators didn't know this system wasn't there. Uh, when Mary Lou talked about the davis bessie event and this happened, their system, their heat removal was still there. So it was very easy to recover from. The steam generator for the Babcock and Wilcox units, the, if you look at these here, well, this one shows it's a one pass. It doesn't have a lot of volume and the turbine trips, there's uh, a way to exhaust this steam. There's no feed water. This boils dry almost instantly. Now there's nowhere for this heat to go. They don't have a reactor water level indicator. They turn the pump off. That causes, that's the start of the event right there. The other big issue with these pilot operated relief valves, very strange design. Most normal pressure operated relief valves, as the system goes up, it'll gradually start opening. These are designed to not open until they get to the, 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 the set point. So there's a little valve off to the side that monitors the, the line pressure, and there's a disc on top that holds it down. That's what got fouled, and all of a sudden when it popped open, it stayed open. So from a learning standpoint, if, this, if that was to happen under today's system, there's a federal law, 10 CFR 21, that requires that operator to notify every other um, plant out there uh, who has these valves, a, re a reactor component engineer and a pro um, procurement engineer are going to look at that and say, oh, that could happen here, and they'll look at it. That wasn't there. The other thing, you know, IMPO would have also put that out as a, as a lesson learned, a, a very high-level operating experience. People just said, we have those valves, could that happen here? So those are some of the things that have happened since then. But you have, you know, 4 a.m., like John was saying, if you ever work shift work, you're not at your best. Um, they hadn't really trained on that. At that time, most of the people operating reactors in the country were right out of the nuclear navy. Uh, good training program, but they would hire them and say, well, you already know enough, here's what you do. And that's great for normal operating procedures. Once you go to something like this that no one ever postulated, and they didn't know they had the aux feed pump, they, they, you know, they, they didn't know their steam generator was dry, it just cascaded very, very quickly. And the oncoming crew comes in and they were like, oh, you're losing pressure here. Shut this block valve, turn the pumps on, it was all done. Um, but actually, as a lot of us know, that was actually just the beginning, not the end. 
Awesome, thank you. So we'll put up the next question, and, and while you folks look at, at which, which aspect you'd like answered, uh, I just want to open it up to the audience for a moment and see if you had any questions up to this point that we can answer. But that system, that system was designed for the normal reactor coolant leak rate, a gallon per hour, maybe if you're a really tight system, a gallon a day. And this was the people at Three Mile Island were concerned because the contractor wanted to release all that Krypton gas and they didn't know how much they had. You described filters that would take care of those things, but we've all got filters in our house. We know they get overwhelmed after a time. And so they weren't going to put bigger filters in there because they were releasing more gas. That was a problem for the people of Three Mile Island, and they think they had a legitimate concern there. Um, no, the, this is, there's a lot of different ways that you can, could have released this pressure. This was the best way using the normal plant systems. And like I said before, the charcoal system did get overwhelmed because of the moisture. Clearly much, much higher concentrations uh, there were probably very few good options, but using this particular system provided the most uh, filtration. Uh, when you look at the conditions, what happens when you release this from the plant stack, it's going up, it's going downwind, and it's going sideways. So there's a lot of dispersion. It got, and it doesn't, it's not like it goes out the community and sits there. It passes over fairly quickly. So when you look at that, and noble gases are a whole body dose. They don't go inside, they don't stay with you, they're not retained. Uh, majority of that dose was from, it's passing over as a plume, and there's some radiation shine that comes down to the people as it passes over. And it doesn't take very long from the time that they vent that to they stop the vent for that plume to pass over. Uh, could they have been informed about that better? Yes. Uh, if you take a look at the emergency classification system, it's the same today as it was then, a usual event, uh, alert, side area emerger, emergency, and general emergency. They never got past the site area emergency there. The same criteria would apply today. That means based on the licensing criteria, by the time those dose rates got to the site boundary, they never exceeded the limits for that release. So, where people, if you don't know, like a lot of us know, that really seems like it's an issue. And I think you, you cannot discount how people felt about that and the impact, because there was, you know, if you look at a, a emergency response organization now, anywhere, especially at power plants, uh, there's more staffing, there's better communications, there's actually a phone in the control room where you pick it up and someone in Bethesda, Maryland is there 24 seven to respond to that. So you have all these things going on. Uh, they didn't know what they were doing. I'm, I'm definitely not diminishing someone's thoughts about it or the fact that some radiation exposure was incurred. But if you look at the, what it, where it came from and the amounts and their options, it was the best option. I don't know if that helps you at all. I'd like to follow up. Sure. That's a good one. But, so um, one thing, and by the way, um, preparing for today, um, I read this book. I highly recommend it. It was recommended to me by a fellow um, nuclear nerd. Um, so if, you, if you're interested, you can come look, look at the title and author uh, later. But I found it very objective and very thorough in looking at all aspects, um, not just the technical bit. But in terms of um, the release of gases, um, one of the weird communication things that happened was um, reporting the doses that were being measured. And, and there were measurements being taken all over the place. And at, at the site boundary, it was never even close to a level that would have caused any sort of um, reporting of a, any sort of event. But at the same time, there was at one point a helicopter that hovered over um, the release um, 
vent, if you will, and they got, of course, uh, a very high dose reading, and both of those levels, you know, below regulatory concern at, at the boundary and this really high reading coming right off the stack were reported to the media, and so there was great confusion about, about what the actual doses were, but there really was, there was never um, a, a threat to public health out from radiation. Thank you, and that, that kind of leads us to our, our next response, Mary Lou, which was, did officials know how much radiation was being released? It sounds like there's a little bit of confusion even among the officials. I don't know if you want to elaborate on that. There was certainly confusion because, again, the commu communication channels weren't well established. But did people know? Were there measurements being taken? Oh, yeah. I mean, there were measurements being taken nonstop at all sorts of locations. It's just that that wasn't being collected and uh, communicated very appropriately. So they knew, certainly after the fact, there was a lot of data um, about what the levels of radiation were at various sites, but at the time, it was very confusing. Great. So that kind of, we can kind of boil it down to a response A here, which is how many people were exposed to dangerous levels of radiation? And Seth, you kind of talked about this in general, but give us a number. Yeah. Oh, as far as dangerous levels, zero. Nobody. Um, when this plume from the release passes over, uh, the only people that could have received any exposure had to be directly under it. And, you know, when you look at like a windrose, you'll see there's probably a few sectors there that it passed over, it dissipates into the atmosphere. Uh, the xenon really has a relatively short half-life, krypton just slightly longer. Um, it, it comes down to, you know, you, you receive medical dose, you plan it, your doctor hopefully talks to you, and it's a planned thing. This is kind of like an unplanned thing, but when you look at it in context of what you would get from a routine medical procedure versus this, now you have to understand these plants discharge both liquid and airborne uh, effluent activity just like this all the time as part of their normal operation. Obviously, we try to reduce that as much as possible. The decay tanks to let it decay or filtration to remove it. But small amounts do get out. And if you compare the effluent release from a nuclear plant uh, to a coal plant, which is burning coal, which contains a lot of uranium, believe it or not, people who live downwind of coal plants get much more radiation dose than people who live downwind of nuclear plants. Um, I think that in our popular culture, any amount of radiation is viewed as somehow especially from a nuclear power plant, more dangerous than anything else. Uh, we look at that in terms of probabilities. Um, typically, in this particular case, we would say, well, what's the case of someone maybe developing cancer from this? This is in the orders of magnitude of millions of billions. It's, it's theoretical. Um, we know a lot about the other end of the spectrum. Uh, we have a lot of epidemiological information from Hiroshima, Nagasaki, all sorts of events where you have very large radiation exposure in very short periods of time. Uh, the workers at Chernobyl, good at the, the most recent example. But when it comes to what we call chronic or very small amounts of radiation over long periods of time, like I said before, your radiation is ubiquitous. It's around us right now. You're getting about 600 milligram a year just living here because of our altitude, our soil, things like that. Now you're saying th the worst case someone could have had during this event was one to two milligram. And so from a technical standpoint, you know, you look at that and you go, okay, I can understand that. But it, at the time, you know, people didn't know if they were supposed to stay in their homes, they were supposed to leave. Um, there was, a, a t there was no structure involved to coordinate this information. And so it, it naturally caused people to, to, to be upset. And I think even to this day, I think that was very accurately portrayed in the, in the documentary that, or, or even in Mary Lou's case, 30 miles away. This is in my backyard, and I don't know. 
okay? And so that's very reasonable. One of the reasons that we like to do these types of events is, is give it that historical context, but without diminishing how those people genuinely felt. Because I think any of us here were probably felt the same way during that time. What's going on? And I'm not getting good information. I think that's a, a natural reaction. Well, sticking with the communication topic, uh, our next question is, was information intentionally kept from the public? We talked a little about uh, you know, confusion and, and different sources of information. So was there anything that actually was not told to the people? No, there was no deliberate keeping, no deliberate withholding of information. There was just a general lack of knowing what was going on. So even, for example, um, you know, officials in, in Washington, D.C. were communicating with Pennsylvania state government, and that's not the same information that was going from the plant to NRC. I mean, there was just uh, different information floating around, um, and so snippets would get to the media, and, and it was all different. Uh, so it was just really hard for the public to understand what was going on because the reporters were getting mixed information, and they also, they also weren't receiving information in context, which is another big thing. I think that was learned from the accident. There needs to be somebody who can talk to a layperson and make it make sense. Um, and you know, I grew up in the nuclear industry, which is very conservative and very rigid in a lot of ways. And, and I can tell you, even though I have a PhD in engineering, I still get grief from, from some of my older, more traditional colleagues that the things I do with outreach and like this event tonight, well, that's fluffy stuff. That's not, that's not real nuclear engineering. Well, to me, it's all part of being a nuclear engineer is being able to effectively communicate about what you do and what it is and what it isn't. Um, so we still have uh, a little ways to go, I think, and, in changing that culture. Uh, but certainly we learned from the accident that that was a huge gap in um, the entire emergency response plans. Thank you. Yeah, and the context is really interesting. You know, if you look at this chart, you know, even working, you know, I work at the lab and you talk to me about REMS or Miller REMS, I'm half the time I'm still, you know, let alone somebody who's never even has no idea of, like what's what's going on. So it's easy to see how even providing them information can cause confusion. So while, while you folks are looking at the next question, um, let's just ask if anyone else in the audience has any other questions so far. Let's see, second row, had your hand just barely quicker. Could you uh, talk a little bit about the uh, uh, aspect of all the alarms going on. Uh, from my perspective, that's a pretty tough thing mentally to, to handle. Uh, I, I've been there. I'm a nuclear engineer, been in reactor field, been in test reactors, and um, when alarms go off, you, you somehow something happens in your mind, especially when it's multiple, and you have a very difficult time prioritizing. Yeah, and I think we'll, we'll have opportunity to talk a little bit about some of the changes, but alarms are still, so obviously something, an event like this happens in basically every alarm. Um, so when, when the plant trips, when it shuts down, um, every alarm goes off. And a, a lot of them have audible alarms, so it's a lot of noise. And I always joke when I'm giving tours of our simulator lab that during events now, it's one operator's full-time job to uh, silence the alarms so that it's not creating this additional noise. Because at that point, they're not informative. You cannot process that much information or prioritize it. And so unfortunately, that alarm issue is still not fully corrupted in really any industry right now. But what we do have are procedures and priorities that tell us that you know, this, this is the thing you need to check. And, go systematically through the process, and you have the capability to, um, to silence the alarms and focus on the important things. And they are trained on these kinds of events um, so frequently that they're used to working in that sort of high-stress 
environment and, and staying calm. So um, great question. The alarm, there's all the alarms still go off though. So that's, that's something that I personally want to fix and it's a very hard problem to fix. So. Very good. Uh, let's see, we had a question in the front row here. It, oh, I have a couple of comments oh, yeah. for that, Joel. Sure. Um, we'll get to yours. The, the other part of that is, like I said before, at the time, the training was minimal for the staff. They had two people there, which is not adequate to look at the entire operational board. And so they made a lot of changes afterwards. They had a, additional control room staff. Uh, one of those positions is called the STA, a shift technical advisor. He's a qualified engineer, qualified reactor operator who kind of sits back and is independent, not involved in the continuous operation and is there for, instead of waiting for the oncoming shift, you already have someone built in. Uh, the licensing process and the rigor for the operators is much greater than it was then. And that's um, a very, and Mary Lou will probably tell you that, getting your reactor operator license is a big deal. Um, remember I mentioned before about the, the big tags, they actually reduced the size of those tags so they can't cover indications. Another thing they did, we call them post-TMI mods. One of the things they did in the control room is they put in this thing called, we call it SPUDS, S-P-D-S, Safety Parameter Display System. The most critical displays that you need, alarms, are on one board, so the primary plant operator can look at that and get a really good idea of what's going on all over the plant in one location. So a lot of changes in the training, in the indicators, but you're right, the, if you've been in there and you see those boards start lighting up, it can be overwhelming. So the, one of the things too is every plant has a simulator. That simulator is identical in the way it operates to the plant. Some of the things that cause the operators problems were when they would hit a switch in the, in the simulator, it would give them an instantaneous uh, change of indication. That's not how the plan operated. So they're sitting there, they're seeing something they've never seen, they hit a switch, and it doesn't match up to their training. So they go right to the next step, like turn the pumps off. And if they had just waited, they would have got the right indication. And they, plus they go through at least every six weeks through that simulator co course. If some other plant has an event that they've never seen, they have programmers that can program that into the simulator and put their operators through that. How will they respond? Are our procedures adequate? So they get a lot of training and retraining, and there's a lot of thought that goes into, like after Fukushima, there were things that happened we never considered in the operation of a power plant that we do now. Thanks, Seth. Okay, let's get this audience question. Okay, so you addressed the minimal exposure to the public. What about to the workers? What kind of exposure did they see? Uh, the, normally, the way the plant runs, you'll run, depending on your fuel cycle, about 18 months, you shut down, you refuel. And during those times, we open up systems, we remove things where workers are more exposed to radiation. The amount of dose that those people got was very comparable to working in the outage situation. No one exceeded any of their administrative control limits, which are far below federal limits. Uh, they had to bring in a lot of people to do that. There was a lot of water in the auxiliary building and the rad waste building, but it really went into an extended maintenance type period. And so the, the exposures that workers got were comparable to what they would during a normal maintenance period. Great question. chemistry lab guy who took the sample off the primary coolant. Stroke cancer and stuff and that he thought it was related to the accident. So I, I assume then that he had quite a bit of exposure if that was, you know, really a result of that. I think the guy who took the chemistry sample was the highest exposed individual at the plant during the accident. And he took and I think what he got was about the yearly dose equivalent that we would get here, or that we limit our workers to for a year. He got it from taking that one sample and then wasn't able to, you know, do any more. But we know where that, that level is, and we would consider that, you know, acceptable for workers. Um, all the other stuff, I think, is 
kind of hyperbole. Yeah. Don't forget, cancer is a disease of age, and for radiation to induce it, depending on the type of radiation and the organ that's affected, there's things called latency periods. So, you know, if you've got exposure today, you're, you're not going to get it. It's like skin cancer. It's like I deal with. You know, it could take a lifetime of exposure for that to uh, manifest itself. Um, I, th I think I didn't, I've never read anything that had any direct relation to that. I've actually been involved in radiation litigation suits where people have claimed exposure were there, and then you find out the person smoked four packs of cigarettes a day for 35 years. Uh, they worked in a spray booth. They put their hands on protected in brake cleaner, and they have all these other environmental factors. And if they claim a disease, it takes 20 or 30 years to manifest. And in radiation is very rarely at the very top of what will uh, cause that. It might be a causal factor, 10, 15, 20 items below. Um, it doesn't, I'm not discounting that it never happens, but it's, it's fairly low incidence out there for people for that to be a direct causal factor in someone's cancer. A lot of times it's, it's lifestyle, it's genetics that actually is the single biggest determinant whether you're gonna get cancer or what type. I'll further oh, comment. Sorry. Oh, sorry. I, I was trying to, I was just gonna, I, no, I'll, I'll, I apologize, but I think, especially with the Netflix series, I think there's, so there's this natural human tendency to find explanations for bad things that happen to us, and cancer is one of those things that is, you know, mysterious, and, and we know a lot of the causes for it. But I, I mean, the the guy who mentioned that he had the throat cancer also mentioned that he was a smoker, and it's probably it's, it's extremely likely that's what um, that that's what causes cancer. But what's really important is to understand that human tendency to sort of confirm what they believe or to look for explanations, um, and really try to understand what we can actually look at understand by data and by, by, by the scientific method. So we have methods and tools that allow us to look at the, you know, the population dynamics to measure what, their, uh, what the rates of cancer are in that state. And they're very, very sophisticated tools um, to, uh, to really get at the truth of that because we have to get past that sort of human tendency to uh, make explanations for things. And so we have to, we have to keep the, hold those systems accountable, but we have to trust them because a lot of effort and, and uh, expertise goes into evaluating those sorts of claims um, scientifically and systematically, so. Yeah, I couldn't have said that better, thank you. And I was just gonna comment that um, we know a lot more now than we knew in 1979. We know a lot more now than we knew right after World War II in terms of the effects of radiation. But there is still a huge debate over the health effects of very low doses, which is what resulted from the TMI accident. And the reason is because the doses are very limited. Or, sorry, the, the, the effects are very limited. We know that radiation is a poor carcinogen. Um, we know it's a poor mutagen. We know a lot. Um, and so there just is, um, now just kind of internal battles over, well, there could be this small might, um, chromosomal change here or there, but the fact that we are as sophisticated as we are, as, as Katya just suggested, in, in um, analyzing the data, and we still don't have a correlation between low-dose radiation and health effects, speaks volumes to me. There really isn't a correlation there. Yes, we'll still study it, but what we know now is certainly not indicative of there being um, health impacts to low-dose radiation. Thank you all for that perspective. Uh, it was a really good discussion. Um, let's bring it back to the Idaho connection a little bit now and talk about why the melted core was moved here to Idaho. And I'm going to ask John if he wants to comment on that first. So this is a great story of you know what we do here for the nation and for the world at Idaho National Laboratory. The the over the years, um, the type of work that Idaho National Laboratory has undertook is, is, is amazing. And the capabilities that have been developed are lend, lend it to being able to solve difficult problems. Um, over, over the early years of the operation of the laboratory, there's been lots of reactor development and fuel development. Um, 
And there's even, you know, we can go back into the history and read the history of INL and there, the first reactor accident, SL1, actually in the nation took place here at INL. I, and actually it was reactor research and test station at the time, so it was way back in 1952. <clears throat> so over the years, INL has developed the expertise as well as the facilities to deal with very complex, difficult problems. And at the time of the Three Mile Island accident, um, we had the only facilities in the nation that had the capability to actually handle uh, safely the core materials and put it into a safe configuration for long-term storage. And so um, experts here at INL actually made the plan for how to disassemble the core in place in the reactor, wrote that in many reports and put the plan together and communicated it back to GPU. GPU executed it on top of the reactor vessel. I think I have a model here. Um, and actual INL personnel were on top of the reactor core uh, operating a lot of the equipment that was designed and built here at INL for the purpose of disassembling the, the core debris material that uh, was now molten in unknown configurations um, and difficult to reach. And so it was successfully disassembled, packaged into um, um, casks meant for the transportation of damaged fuel. It was brought here to INL um, by train and then loaded on, offloaded onto a truck on site at the central facility location and then trucked up to the what used to be referred to as the big shop. I called it the big shop. Other people called it the, hot, the tan hot shop, but it was large. And it was a, kind of a special built um, hot cell with thick walls that could shield workers. You could do remote work in it with manipulators and protect the workers. And it had a special feature. Not only did it, could you bring a truck into the place, you could drive the truck all the way into the hot, the hot cell and unload the cask remote from a remote location with manipulators. It also had a pool of water that was integrated into the floor of the facility that they could then just drop the um, containers into and easily unload the damaged fuel uh, into, into storage containers. And so it was a very kind of unique special facility that existed here at the time that made it much easier to handle and um, um, do work on the damaged core, put it into a safe configuration. Um, uh, Mike? Go ahead. So, so the Netflix show made a big deal about removing the top uh, or the crane that lifted off the cap of the reactor, I think, as you were talking about, right. INL people being there. And it, it, it seemed to focus on a whistleblower's feeling that they hadn't gone through the proper process to certify the equipment that was going to be used. It's my takeaway as a non-nuclear person in this room. Um, and, and I, and I, I, and it eventually it was obviously removed and the core was disassembled and shipped here to Idaho. But could you help me understand, as a non-nuclear person, kind of what that issue was that was raised in the Netflix documentary? That's a, that's a good question. Turn this on. So in all the years that I've worked with people um, in and around all of the work that took place here at INL and at TMI, I never actually heard about the polar crane incident. I had not heard about that um, until it was on the Netflix show. It's not to minimize that he didn't think that that was a real issue. Um, my perspective is, is that in these types of issues, in these types of challenging situations, you're always dealing with things like that. Um, the polar crane is a normal piece of equipment that is designed to lift the vessel head off of that reactor and do it every outage. So every 12 to 18 months, that polar crane would be put into service and used for that exact purpose. The question was, as I understood from the Netflix uh, show, um, was that there was some question that it might have been damaged in the deflagration event of the burning of residual hydrogen gas that was in the containment building. It might have damaged some parts of it. But I kind of believe Lake Barrett. Uh, well, I know Lake. And so he's the only one that I have to measure against on the actual stories on the, on the show, is that Lake said, 
we looked at the evidence and we inspected the crane, we tested the crane and it worked fine and we went forward with, you know, with the evolution, which was a normal operating procedure for the plant basically to use the polar crane to lift that vessel head. And um, they, and, and I, I was even confused from the Netflix show when they first started to try to use the crane, something happened with the crane. And then they, they stopped which every, we would do in, in our industry today. If you encounter a problem that is not as affected, you stop and, insp and investigate. So they stopped and investigated, corrected the problem, and then successfully used the evolution and the crane and made the vessel head lift successfully, safely. And then the show ended, right? So I was even confused as to the problem that was there. I think it's kind of like, I had the opportunity to, um, talk to the gentleman from TEPCO, the utility that's responsible for Fukushima cleanup and response. And it was early in the, in the evolution. They hadn't actually done anything in the reactors in probably about 2013 or 2014. And he was here and we were talking about how to deal with these types of situations. And I said, you know, one thing you need to do whenever you plan to do an evolution of work is have a backup plan. Because for sure something's gonna go wrong and you need to have a way, a plan B, to either correct what's gone wrong or to have an alternative path. And if you, I don't know if you remember, I watched Fukushima kind of specifically. And one of the first things they, they, they entered into the plant too with was a snake robot that was meant to go downstairs and be able to navigate through complex corridors and things like that, and it got down onto the like the first flight of stairs and it got stuck, <laughs> and um, and then they couldn't retrieve it, and then it got it was fully stuck there forever. So they just abandoned it. And I saw him about a year after that activity took place, and he brought that up, and he said he was standing watching the operator with the the the, the control joystick operating the snake robot and the operator got it to a point and it got stuck and instead of just stopping and deciding on you know what's wrong investigating what's wrong and then making a path an alternative path the operator kept trying to go for it kept going for it kept for it and it put the, it eventually put the snake and robot in the wrong place and couldn't get it out and he said he thought back to the exact advice that I told him was always have a plan B and so I think that's something that we've taken away from um, these types of incidents and hard to deal with um, challenging work environments um, in this industry is that we have very good planning, very good um, backup plans, and an ethic that is um, if you encounter a situation that is not expected, you stop and investigate and re regroup. And so I think that's probably what happened on the polar crane. And the operator who was the main sort of character voice in the, in the Netflix series disagreed with that. So there's always disagreeing voices and we try to work those out. I couldn't see what happened and what went wrong that he was out of, his, out of the polar grain in the end because it successfully worked, right? Okay, Mary, Mary Lou's gonna talk to you. <laughs> so. I can speak directly to that. So um, the gentleman you're talking about, the whistleblower, um, did bring a complaint. And one of the other people they interviewed for the Netflix series, but really cut down to minimal um, text, was Lake Barrett. And Lake Barrett was uh, with the NRC. He actually, after the um, Netflix series did a webinar with the American Nuclear Society where he specific, specifically addressed that issue. And he said the bottom line was that there was the government way of writing out what was going to be done, the way we do procedures, and then there was the industry way of writing out what was going to be done and do procedures. And the whistleblower just didn't like the type of procedures that were being written. And Lake repeatedly asked, are there safety concerns? Is what you're talking about anything that will impact the safety of what we're proposing to do? And he, he said no. He just didn't like the way they were writing the procedures. So it really wasn't anything about 
what was happening with repairing the crane, how they were going to, um, they had to do some, you know, fixing and, and um, a little bit of backfitting to do what was required. But the whistleblowing was never about anything technical. It was about the paperwork. Thank you. Uh, we're, we're about out of time, but we do want to finish up with our last um, poll question here, which was, about lessons learned, it was could it happen again? And I'm gonna I'm gonna throw this over to Kaya to answer because I think she has a really good succinct way of, of putting this one. Highlighting succinctness, I guess. Um, so I, I think actually Seth talked a lot about a lot of the things that I talk about in terms of the sort of human factors and operational things. Um, so and, and also Mary Lou talked about them. So sharing operating experience, we we've learned a lot from this experience from from this event and we've applied it to everything we do. And it still affects everything we do in terms of operations. The cultures that we have at, at um, our facilities at INL and also at nuclear power plants are so focused on safety and doing things the right way um, for the right reasons uh, that it, it is extremely um, hard to imagine that this exact type of event would happen. Um, we're clearly gonna have things happen that we don't expect. Um, that, that's, there's, we're gonna have failures in our nuclear power plants. And what we have to know and understand is that we have a huge amount of processes and procedures and um, design changes, technical changes to the nuclear power plants that makes it very unlikely that it'll result in something uh, like a meltdown that happened at, through Mile Island. Those kinds of, um, the the number of things that we've done to change, including sharing operating experience. Anytime anything happens um, that's, that, that is critical, on a critical component, it goes to everyone. That goes to all the people who, who have it. And then if, it's, uh, if there's an event that has an operating uh, element to it, it also go, gets incorporated into training. So when those operators are in their high fidelity simulators that are just like their control rooms, they train on those events. They get experience um, thinking about these things. They've changed the way they structure the procedures, so it takes them very systematically through um, how to diagnose the event so that the operators have a lot more support in understanding the situation. Mary Lou mentioned training. Um, both Seth and Mary Lou mentioned training, and so the training and accreditation of operators is extremely rigorous, and it is continuous, and operators get uh, a lot of, of support in understanding how the systems work, what can happen, how things can go wrong, and really exposed to dealing with multiple failures. And they really throw challenging events at the operators. And so they're not only training them to respond to the events that we postulate, but hopefully they're helping them think in a better way so that they can respond to things that we haven't thought about. And then a couple of other things, the um, SPDS or SPUDs that Seth mentioned, gives the operators the information that they didn't have in this event that, they, um, that would have prevented them from shutting down the reactor coolant pumps because they would have understood that they had a loss of coolant um, and that they, they were losing uh, the level in the reactor core. So those things all point to, and that not, that's just a small list of things. I think we could talk all evening about all the, all the changes that have been made. And also just the accountability and oversight in, in the process for what the operator, what the, how we operate the plants how we communicate to each other across the industry and also how we communicate to the public and to, uh, to the regulators, so. Excellent. Uh, well, thank you very much. So that brings us back around to our word cloud. So now that we've had a chance to talk things through, let's see what everybody has to say about it. So now maybe what we're thinking about when we think of Three Mile Island is lessons learned. So maybe the, 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 the details of the accident aren't quite as worrisome to people and, and that it really shows how it, it served as an opportunity for the nuclear industry to evolve and adapt. So um, I'd like to thank you all for coming out to our discussion uh, and I'd like to remind you to fill out this uh, survey card. If you didn't pick one up, you can grab one at the back of the room there. We've still got some snacks it looks like. And uh, we've really enjoyed being able to have this opportunity to come have this discussion with you. And with that, uh, we will adjourn. Thank you, everyone.